Good evening, and welcome to the Crypto Overnighter. I'm Nicodemus, and I will be your host as we take a look at the latest cryptocurrency news and analysis. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. And remember, none of this is financial advice. And it's 10 p.m. Pacific on Sunday, September 24th, 2023. Welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter, where we have no sponsors, no hidden agendas, and no BS. But we do have the news, so let's talk about that. Tonight, we delve deep into regulatory landscapes, both embraced and fought against, from Coinbase's strategic moves in Spain to the SEC and the DOJ's glaring divide. We also discuss the Terra Classic community's radical decision, a legal quagmire at Fenwick and West, and the UK's troubling tryst with privacy. Finally, the CFTC's decision to shut down Cauchy's political prediction markets will round up tonight's discussions. Stay tuned. This episode is packed with stories that offer a panoramic view of the world of crypto governance. Coinbase just secured anti-money laundering registration from the Bank of Spain. This is a significant milestone in Coinbase's global expansion strategy, and it's a move that could have far-reaching implications for the crypto landscape in Spain and the European Union at large. The AML registration allows Coinbase to offer its full suite of products and services to both retail and institutional investors in Spain. This means Spanish citizens can now buy, sell, and trade crypto assets in euros, and they can also retain custody of their crypto assets on Coinbase. This is a big deal, especially considering that Spain is a member of the EU, which recently adopted the markets and crypto assets regulations. Spain has shown a growing interest in cryptocurrencies. A study revealed that 29% of adults in Spain believe that crypto is the future of finance. Even more intriguing, crypto has surpassed traditional bank transfers to become Spain's second most preferred payment method. Coinbase's Vice President of International and Business Development emphasized the company's commitment to regulatory compliance. In the past year, Coinbase has obtained vast registrations in Italy, Ireland, and the Netherlands. They've also received in-principle approvals in Singapore, Brazil, and Canada. This is part of Coinbase's Phase 2 international expansion strategy, which focuses on obtaining licenses and registrations, customizing user experiences, and establishing strategic local partnerships. But let's not forget the bigger picture here. The EU's micro-regulations are set to go live in 2024. These regulations aim to provide much-needed clarity for cryptocurrency operations in the EU. Coinbase's AML registration in Spain is a strategic move that aligns with these upcoming regulations signaling the exchange's intent to be a major player in the EU's crypto market. Coinbase's entry into Spain comes on the heels of Crypto.com obtaining regulatory approval in the country. This suggests that Spain is becoming a hotbed for crypto activity, and it's a trend we should all be watching closely. Coinbase's AML registration in Spain sets a precedent for other exchanges and provides a roadmap for navigating the complex regulatory landscape in the EU. This move by Coinbase is aimed at capturing a market that's already showing a high level of crypto adoption. The fact crypto surpassed traditional bank transfers as a preferred payment method in Spain speaks volumes. The Bank of Spain's willingness to grant AML registration also signals a cautious but real acceptance of crypto, contrasting sharply with the often hostile regulatory environment in the U.S. This is part of a broader strategy for Coinbase, which has been securing similar approvals in other European countries. It's clear that while the U.S. grapples with regulatory challenges, Coinbase is not waiting. They're pushing into markets that offer not just growth, but a more favorable regulatory climate. This is a calculated move to decentralize their operations and reduce dependency on any single market, a strategy that could pay off as global financial systems continue to evolve. Now, before we leap into our next story, remember to follow and get notifications to never miss an episode. Now, let's pivot. Coinbase is expanding, But the government agencies aren't following the same playbook. Speaking of which, what's the deal with the SEC and the DOJ? And this one's our cover story for tonight. John Reed Stark, a former SEC enforcement veteran, openly criticized the U.S. Department of Justice for its lack of action in crypto-related cases. Stark's critique is a glaring spotlight on the DOJ's inaction, especially when compared to the SEC's numerous enforcement actions in the crypto space. Stark has nearly two decades of experience in the SEC Division of Enforcement. He termed the DOJ's lack of prosecutions as a, quote, extraordinary dearth. He's particularly concerned about the DOJ's non-inclusion of certain individuals as defendants, contrasting this with the SEC's active role in bringing enforcement actions. Stark's comments echo the sentiment that the SEC, 
primarily being a civil enforcement agency, can only do so much. Without the DOJ stepping in, entities may continue to trivialize the SEC's interventions as mere operational costs. Stark points out that major crypto exchanges like Binance and Coinbase treat SEC charges as badges of honor. Tyler Winklevoss, co-founder at the Gemini Exchange, dismissed SEC allegations as, quote, super lame, likening them to manufactured parking tickets. This attitude trivializes the regulatory framework, making it a mere hurdle rather than a safeguard for investors. According to a report from Semaphore, the DOJ is contemplating pressing fraud charges against Binance, but federal prosecutors are wary of the potential market instability and consumer fallout that might ensue from an indictment. They're considering alternative resolutions like fines or non-prosecution agreements. Meanwhile, the DOJ is restructuring the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team to handle the increasing volume of crypto-related investigations. Stark's critique comes in the wake of a high-profile case involving the founder of FTX. While Sam bankman fried is facing SEC enforcement actions, Stark can't fathom why SBF's parents haven't been added as defendants. He suggests that they should at least be named as relief defendants. Stark's critique raises a crucial question. Why is the DOJ so hesitant to act? The SEC, despite its limitations as a civil enforcement agency, has been proactive. But without the DOJ stepping in, these actions risk becoming mere operational costs for crypto entities. Stark's observations reflect a broader issue. The lack of criminal prosecutions creates a gap in the regulatory landscape, allowing entities to exploit the system. The DOJ's hesitance could be due to the fear of market instability. But isn't that what regulations are for? To bring stability and integrity? The restructuring of the end set suggests that the DOJ is gearing up, but is it too little too late? Stark's critique serves as a wake-up call. It's high time the DOJ stepped up its game to ensure that the crypto market is not just a playground for those willing to skirt the law. It's well past time for the DOJ to step up its game. Only the threat of DOJ prosecution can make crypto entities take enforcement seriously. Stark's comments are a glaring indictment of the DOJ's lack of initiative. It's about time someone said it. The ball is now in the DOJ's court. Will they pick it up, or will they continue to let the SEC play the game alone? Only time will tell. Now, if you're finding value in our deep dives, hit that like button. The SEC and the DOJ, two sides of the same coin, but pulling in different directions. In contrast, the Terra community is unifying for a big move. The Terra Classic community voted to cease all minting and reminting of Terra Classic USD, also known as USTC. This is the same algorithmic stablecoin that was at the heart of Terra's jaw-dropping $45 billion collapse. The Terra Classic community voted with a 59% approval to halt the minting mechanism. This move aims to protect not just the community, but also outside investors who've been burning USTC in hopes of achieving a repeg to the US dollar. The current value of USTC? A measly 1.2 cents apiece. Terra used to allow users to swap between UST and Luna freely, but when UST depegged, the mechanism failed spectacularly. Trillions of Luna tokens were minted, and the price of UST plummeted below one cent. The community now aims to burn those trillions of tokens to help USTC regain its original $1 peg. So far, they've only managed to burn 75 billion tokens, which is around 1% of the nearly 6 trillion circulating tokens. After the collapse, Terraform Labs launched Terra 2.0, while the Terra Classic community stood by the original blockchain. The decision to halt USTC minting is a clear divergence from the new version, making it a pivotal moment for the community and the crypto world at large. The proposal also opens doors for major crypto exchanges like Binance to start burning USTC. Why? Because the minting and reminting are over. This is a crucial step for the community's goal to re-establish a stable peg between USTC and the US dollar. The Terra Classic community is taking a bold step to correct past mistakes and to safeguard its future. It's a move that reflects the community's distrust in the original mechanism and a desperate attempt to regain lost ground. As we watch this unfold, one thing is clear. The Terra Classic community is not going down without a fight. Don't forget to subscribe for more Nightly Insights. As Terra makes its stand, Fenwick and West finds itself embroiled in a class action lawsuit. Let's take a look. Fenwick and West, a law firm that once represented FTX, is currently embroiled in a class action lawsuit. 
The lawsuit began in August, with customers alleging that Fenwick & West was partially responsible for fraudulent activities at FTX. In response, Fenwick filed a legal document on September 22nd, aiming to dismiss the lawsuit. The firm defended itself on multiple grounds, stating that the defendants failed to prove that Fenwick acted outside the scope of representation. They also argued there was no evidence to show that Fenwick had knowledge of, or directly assisted in, FTX's alleged fraudulent activities. Fenwick further clarified that it did not orchestrate FTX's fraud. The plaintiffs instead pointed their finger at Sam Bankman fried Fenwick stated that it represented only FTX and not Sam or any other company insider. The law firm also noted that it was just one of many firms that represented FTX and described its services as routine. Fenwick also responded to allegations that it provided services that went well beyond typical legal services. These services included employing lawyers who later joined FTX, creating companies through which SBF later committed fraud, and advising FTX on regulatory compliance related to cryptocurrency trading. Fenwick's attempt to distance itself from alleged fraudulent activities at FTX is a significant development. It's about the broader implications for the legal entities that serve the crypto industry. If Fenwick is found liable, it could set a precedent that puts all law firms in the crypto industry under scrutiny. This could lead to a chilling effect where legal firms become hesitant to represent crypto companies, thereby affecting the industry's growth and regulatory compliance. Moreover, the focus on Fenwick's routine services and the lawyers who left the firm to join FTX raises questions about the blurred lines between legal advice and active participation in a client's business. This could be a watershed moment for how law firms engage with crypto companies, especially those under regulatory scrutiny. The case also brings attention to the role of law firms in the crypto ecosystem. Are they just advisors, or do they become enablers when they cross certain boundaries? Fenwick's defense seems to hinge on the idea that they were unaware of FTX's alleged fraudulent activities. But in an industry as volatile and as scrutinized as crypto, can ignorance be a valid defense? This lawsuit could be a bellwether for how the legal system treats the complex relationships between law firms and crypto companies. It's not just about Fenwick and West or FTX. It's about the integrity of the legal structures that support the burgeoning crypto industry. For an industry that already has trust issues with centralized entities, this case could either alleviate or exacerbate those concerns. If this content resonates, sound off in the comments below. Fenwick is on the defense, but the UK government is on the offensive against privacy. Let's unravel this next. Harry Halpin is the CEO of NIM Technologies. He came out swinging against the UK's recent moves to mandate encryption backdoors. Now, why should you care? Because this isn't just a UK issue, it's a global concern that could have ripple effects on privacy, cybersecurity, and yes, the world of crypto. Halpin argues that the UK's regulatory environment is run by a gerontocracy of people who don't understand technology. The UK recently passed the Online Safety Bill, which policymakers claim will protect minors online. However, this bill has a darker side. It mandates companies to include a backdoor in their encryption technologies. The pretext? Safeguarding minors from online predators. But let's not kid ourselves. This is a blatant attack on individual privacy. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is a nonprofit digital rights group. They're warning that this bill will lead to a more censored, locked down internet for British users. Worse, it empowers the UK government to undermine privacy, not just for its citizens, but for internet users worldwide. Halpin states that by pushing for these so called simple solutions, the UK is hurting itself. Making encryption illegal will drive people and organizations that rely on encryption to leave the country. Now, let's talk about NIM Technologies. Founded in 2019 and based in Switzerland, the company launched its privacy-focused decentralized identity platform NIM in 2020 on the Cosmos blockchain. The idea for NIM was born out of outrage by the European Commission and the European Union about NSA surveillance. The platform currently consists of over 600 nodes. Halpin emphasizes that privacy and regulatory compliance can coexist. He envisions a new era of privacy-enhanced apps and believes that regulators will eventually understand the need for privacy-enhancing technologies. Why? Because privacy is crucial for cryptocurrency to enter the mainstream and defend human rights. The UK's decision to mandate encryption backdoors is not just a local issue. It's a global concern. When a country as important as the UK makes such a move, it sets a dangerous precedent. The policy is not only flawed, it also reveals a glaring ignorance about how technology works. 
Halpin's criticism hits the nail on the head. The UK's politicians are out of touch with the technology landscape, and their decisions could have far-reaching consequences. For the crypto community, this is a red flag. Encryption is the bedrock of cryptocurrencies. I mean, it's in the name. Any policy that undermines encryption is a direct threat to the financial freedom and privacy that cryptocurrencies offer. The involvement of organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation and companies like NIM Technologies shows there's a strong counter-narrative. These entities are fighting for the future of the internet and by extension, the future of crypto. Before we round off, remember to share this episode. The UK's battle against privacy has global implications, much like the CFTC's decision to put an end to Kalshi's markets. Kalshi, a prediction market, had plans to let users bet on which party would control the US Congress. Sounds like fun, right? Well, the CFTC didn't think so. The regulator said that these contracts would involve, quote, unlawful gaming and activity would be contrary to the public interest. This decision came after Kalshi X LLC submitted their proposal in June 2023. The contracts would have been settled in cash and allowed users to bet on yes or no questions, specifically whether Republicans or Democrats would control the House and Senate in any given term. Now, let's not forget that last year, an appeals court ruled that another prediction market, Predict It, should be allowed to continue operating until a final court ruling. This was despite a CFTC order to shut it down. So what gives? Why the double standard? Kalshi's CEO, Tarek Mansour, said he fundamentally disagrees with the CFTC's decision. He remains optimistic that the company's vision will be recognized and embraced in time. Mansour cited financial innovations like exchange-traded funds and green futures that initially met skepticism but later gained acceptance. On the other side, Dennis Kelleher, CEO of consumer advocacy organization Better Markets, praised the CFTC's decision as well-grounded and thoughtful. According to Kelleher, these markets are not designed to be casinos for wild speculation-only bets. He cited risks to election integrity and alleged violations of the Commodities Exchange Act in Kalshi's proposal. Mansour's disagreement with the CFTC is noteworthy. It echoes the sentiment of many in the crypto community who see these regulatory decisions as hindrances to progress. Mansour's optimism about the future acceptance of such financial novelties is a sentiment shared by many. But how long will it take for these innovations to be accepted, and at what cost? Gallagher's support for the CFTC's decision is also telling. It's a reminder that there are still voices out there that believe in the importance of regulation, even if it comes at the cost of stifling innovation. But let's be real. The term public interest is often a smokescreen for maintaining the status quo and protecting centralized systems. The CFTC's decision is a clear signal to the crypto community. It shows that regulators are not ready to embrace decentralized prediction markets, especially when it comes to political outcomes. This is yet another example of how central authorities are stifling innovation in the crypto space. It's a reminder that the fight for financial freedom and decentralization is far from over. So what happened? Coinbase got the green light for anti-money laundering registration in Spain, marking another milestone in its global expansion. This move aligns with the EU's upcoming MICA regulations and sets the stage for Coinbase in a market already enthusiastic about crypto. John Reed Stark, a former SEC veteran, criticized the US Department of Justice for its lack of action in crypto cases. Stark's critique shines a light on the DOJ's hesitancy, making the SEC's efforts appear like operational costs rather than effective regulations. The Terra Classic community voted to cease minting their troubled stablecoin, USTC. With its value at a paltry 1.2 cents a piece, the community aims to burn trillions of tokens to regain its original $1 peg. Fenwick and West is embroiled in a lawsuit over their role with crypto exchange FTX. Their defense and the lawsuit itself could set a precedent for how legal firms engage with crypto companies moving forward. Harry Halpin, CEO of NIM Technologies, openly criticized the UK's mandate for encryption backdoors. This move is not just a local issue. It's a global concern that could have ripple effects on privacy and cybersecurity. The CFTC ended Kalshi's plans to allow users to bet on political outcomes. The regulator cited concerns about unlawful gaming and activity, signaling a reluctance to embrace decentralized prediction markets in the political arena. The overarching theme tonight is a dance between regulation and resistance. From Coinbase's strategic acceptance of Spanish regulations to the DOJ's inaction causing friction with the SEC. 
Each story tells a tale of governance in the cryptosphere. On the one hand, we see entities complying with or even welcoming regulations, as is the case with Coinbase in Spain. On the other hand, resistance is evident, whether it's the Terra Classic community trying to self-regulate or Harry Halpin railing against the UK's encryption policies. These stories are more than just headlines. They're signposts on the roadmap of crypto governance. They indicate where the industry could head, either toward a more collaborative future with regulators or a tangle of red tape and litigation. The moves made by these organizations and regulators will either foster innovation and privacy or create roadblocks that stifle financial freedom. These are not just isolated incidents. They're interwoven narratives that offer a glimpse into the crypto world's complex relationship with governance. Whether it's the divisive stance between the SEC and the DOJ, the classic community's desperate measures, or the UK's troubling encryption laws, each story contributes to the larger dialogue about crypto regulation and freedom. As we wrap up tonight, it's evident that we're at a pivotal moment. The choices made today will either pave the way for a harmonious or contentious future between crypto community and regulators. What's certain is that the world of crypto continues to grapple with the challenges and opportunities of navigating governance, for better or worse. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. If you enjoyed tonight's show, then please like, follow, subscribe, leave a rating, or maybe a review. And in the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow night.